Thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight on Soapbox Sacramento. I'm Laura Rubalcaba, your hostess this evening. Before we get into tonight's show, um, I just want to give you a heads up on what I'm looking at for my next show. I'm very concerned about the utility rate increases that are coming to all the residents of the city of Sacramento. I'm concerned because even though these are small bills, these are large increases. We're looking at 9, 10, and 16 percent each year over four years. So I'm looking to do a show on this. Unfortunately, this is a show that was taped in advance of its showing. So at this time, we haven't yet had the meeting on Wednesday. But by the time we have the show, we will have had the meeting. There's a, a meeting of the Utilities Commission at Sacramento City Hall. And so I'm asking my viewers to look in the paper, to look at local coverage, get educated on this meeting that will have recently happened. And that's the next show that I want to bring to my viewers. Um, because even though the commission will the commission will be providing recommendations to the city council and that vote will occur, occur at city council in the month of February or March and I want my viewers to be informed about it. You know this show wouldn't even be able to happen if it weren't for our sponsors so I'd like to thank right now before we even get started on our show tonight I'd like to thank Pieces Pizza in Midtown Sacramento and The Humor Times published by James Israel who, on a side note, will be um, filling in and, and will be participating as a host on the show also. We're very happy to bring his, you know, offbeat sense of humor because he does do a satirical newspaper on politics. So look for that coming in the future. I appreciate all of the viewers that have been sticking with me. Tonight's show, we're going to be talking about homeless. I know this is a show that I've, that's been done a lot here recently. This is a big issue here in Sacramento. Um, the homeless encampment has been going on for 40 days or so, but prior to that, there was a weekly feeding that, that took place. And so this is a big issue. This is why we've come back to it a bunch of times, and there's been just a lot of things since the beginning. And the last time I came and talked to you, it was about the proposal of some really big money in budgets going forward. But since then, more has happened, and that's why we're doing a show again. So I'd like to introduce you to my, my guest tonight. I have Shahara, the director of the California Homeless Youth Project right here in Sacramento, and also Barry Mas Ma uh, Mass Teller, Mass Teller, yeah. who, Mass Teller, who is part of the occupation that's taking place at Correct. City Hall and, and is really here to talk about how people who are down dealing with the issues what give that perspective, you know, because a lot of times we get people in here who are talking about the homeless. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So let's talk with and about. Let's get started. I'm so excited. So tell us about what you're doing. Um, I just want you to get us started, please. Sure, yeah. Um, so I do research and policy on youth homelessness throughout the state of California. Uh, and one of the recent publications I just had was called Adding Insult to Injury about the criminalization of homelessness and its impact on youth throughout California. It was really heavily informed by young people here in Sacramento in terms of recommendations what they would like to see. Um, I got to talk with young people at WIND, um, uh, drop-in center for homeless youth as well as a shelter um, <clears throat> about their experiences with law enforcement uh, and what happens to them when they don't have another place to you know, sleep outside. Um, they don't have another place to sleep and end up sleeping outside uh, and the response they get from you know, sheriff, police, things like that and what they would like to see um, alternatively. So I'm interested to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing at the state level to kind of increase the awareness around anti-homelessness laws and the approach that local communities are taking to addressing homelessness using law enforcement and criminal justice system as opposed to you know like a social safety net type of strategy um, and how that can be really problematic. And, and like I said in a moment ago was that we're back here again because something else has happened mm -hmm. and that something else is the Homeless Bill of Rights has been introduced again. This is such fabulous artwork that they have for this. Has been reintroduced again at the state level. This is a, a it's been introduced by 
how do you say L U I? How do you Lou. say Lou? Lou. Yeah. Senator Lou. Mm -hmm. And where is he out of? She. She, yeah. So Senator um, Carol Lou is out of La Canada, Flint Ridge, Glendale. Uh, so it's near Los Angeles, um, I believe Pasadena. Yes, she represents that area. She's been a champion on issues around homelessness well, for several very, years. Well, it's a very, very powerful legislation because it would overturn all of the all of the criminalization of camping. Mm -hmm. You know, it wouldn't inter overturn every single law against homelessness, but mm -hmm. it would overturn the ones on camping, the ones mm -hmm. on eating, mm -hmm. and the ones on begging. Am I right? Um, I don't think there's one in there for, for the begging, for the panhandling um, ordinances, but it's anything related to rest. And so the way the authors have described that is sitting, sleeping, standing, laying down. Um, the, you know, so it's like loitering, anti-camping. Is there anything like there that. for eating? Yeah, and then also the sharing <laughs> food. Mm -hmm. Sharing of food. Yeah. So, because one of the things that we've seen down at the um, encampment is that um, the police are coming in and taking the sleeping bags. Mm -hmm. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, that wouldn't be an issue nine months out of the year, but in the month of January, it's been devastating. You take away the sleeping bag of someone that does not have a home to live in, that really impacts their survival, that really impacts their health. They get sick. I, I see them. I see, I've seen Q had pneumonia. There's another friend here um, who's also been sick, and, and it's like, how do you come back to health when they're taking your sleeping bag? So yeah. it's very sad. Yeah, and I think that what's really problematic about those laws is that they refer to that kind of stuff like sleeping bags and tents as camping paraphernalia as opposed to survival gear. Right. You know, and we're talking about temperatures getting freezing, sometimes it is a difference between life and death it in really different is. parts of the state. I know I was talking to a legislator today who represents um, uh, desert regions down in Southern California and that because of the extreme heat during the summer and the extreme cold during the winter, it really can be a life and death issue. And so I think to call that stuff camping paraphernalia, when that's actually that's what you need to um, stay warm to survive, it's survival gear. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. So they're not taking away camping paraphernalia. They're taking away survival gear. They're taking survivor, yeah. survivor, survival gear mm -hmm. from people who have nothing. And I'm so glad to have you here with, with youth because mm -hmm. um, I recently did a search on um, Google memes. I was looking for memes, pictures having to do with, I searched for compassion mm -hmm. for homeless. Mm. And one of them I turned up was a young woman and she's holding this sign and it said, all I did was turn 18. Mm -hmm. And that is what homeless youth are guilty of. They're guilty of not having a place with their parents, either they're 18 or, I mean, yeah. there's some very difficult um, homes for youth to live in that aren't accepted in many ways around perhaps gender issues mm -hmm. or even not that. Just mm -hmm. in this, you know, arguments about you need to get a job to live here. I'd be awesome if I could get a job, but actually, um, I went down to Walmart and all the retirees are working there. Right. There's a lot of jobs that used to go to youth that are going to retirees post the last recession. Mm -hmm. And the joblessness among youth, I feel like, is a devastating problem. Yeah. I mean, this current problem that you deal with with homelessness, mm -hmm. um, they need not only homes, they need jobs. We, mm -hmm. we, let me, let me be more specific. We need our youth to have jobs because it sets up their whole, it sets up the future of our, I want to I keep one, not, I want to say there, this is our, this is our, mm. this is our species, this is us. We, we. Mm -hmm. this is we exactly. and the youth are our future. Yeah. So I don't want to call, I don't want to say they. This isn't they, this is us, this is, yeah. yes. And yes. I think it was so many young people here in Sacramento experiencing homelessness, and they're such bright, shiny stars, every one of them. Um, every generation produces bright, shiny stars. I'm not surprised. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that they're a lot of the most sort of socially aware, resilient, capable, yes. um, active young people that I know, and a lot of them have tried uh, to no avail to find 
employment. And why? Um, because a lot of these young people are not only experiencing economic poverty, they're experiencing relationship poverty, right? Oh. So not having the attachment to supportive adults, um, that's how you find employment. Honestly, I, I know that for me and so many other folks like me, you know, you got a job in part because somebody helped to open a door for you. Um, you know, it, they you know occur what, out of relationships. That's the absolute truth. Mm -hmm. I was um, born and raised in Florida in a trailer by a single mom and ate um, reduced lunches. I came mm -hmm. from poverty. Mm -hmm. My mother and father divorced when I was one. My father came back into my life fortunately for me later when it was time for me to go to college and he paid for me to go to college and I'm now a civil engineer for the state of California mm -hmm. and that entire success is because somebody somebody was interested in my future right. I did not have relationship poverty right right yeah and you can see what a protective factor that is to have supportive adults who care about you who can not only um, help to show you what sorts of jobs are out there but just to be motivator right. and to say right. like how is that coming along or what can I do to you know help get you what you need um, to be able There's to be successful disconnect. yeah well I think yeah. too I mean I'm just gonna be myself and say I think I think one of the things that's going on with how we're looking at immigration they want to fight against immigrants coming to, to do our cheap jobs, but when they're looking at reforming immigration, they want to get more technical people, more educated people in here. And that means our kids don't, don't have jobs to go. Why, why? They don't want to train our kids. Mm -hmm. This is something that scares me, is the possibility that the youth today are more valuable incarcerated than they are educated mm. because there's profit centers around incarceration uh, around making phone calls to people that are incarcerated mm -hmm. it goes on and on and you know mm, yeah, all these mm. monies are being spent on litigation and well and, and part of the problem is that we've got um, first technology taking away a lot of jobs and then globalization mm -hmm. supply chaining you know there's a lot mm -hmm. of competition for jobs so frankly we don't need people to do jobs. Right. There's a lot less jobs. Yeah, and I think that it's important to recognize too that people have intrinsic value unto themselves whether or not they have employment. You know, and I think that that's so hard for people who have been so disenfranchised, you know, by a system that is not really serving them um, because you feel like because you can't find employment you don't have value and not only do you start to feel that way but people start to tell you that you know they tell you get a job um, they tell you you know I work hard as they walk by in their suit as if as if a person living on the street does not work hard they work plenty hard and I'm sure you know absolutely yeah very be happy to talk more about that um, but I think that you know it's just it's important to not just say a person's value lies solely in their economic status Every day yeah. is a struggle. Out I the think, streets. yeah, yeah. You know what? We've really been dominating. Um, I'm so sorry. I feel like mm. not at all. I'm enjoying. You know, everything that you're talking about are the same topics, and it does. It goes right back to the city council. Um, There's a very bright young lady um, that Nick. spoke at the last um, mm -hmm. the last city council meeting, and um, that's pretty much when the when uh, Vice Mayor Jennings slammed down the gavel and it was over with. You can see it up on on YouTube, I was, it was covered really well. And um, we had to wait, us, the homeless population, had to wait until the end of the city council meeting to actually uh, have these topics addressed. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, we, we need more representation. I sent out an email, um, this is the way we contact the city council and the way we're told when we go into city hall is you need to email these people first. So uh, Eric Guerrera, I've got an email out to Eric and uh, about four days ago and I'm still waiting to hear back from him. So. Well, I hope you do. Yeah, I think it's really problematic some of the issues that we're seeing in terms of how local elected in Sacramento are responding to the community experiencing homelessness who are protesting um, because there has been this marginalization of an issue that really actually impacts all of us and I think that, you know, kind of the privatization of public space or the way we're limiting public space. You know, homeless folks are kind of on the front lines of that, but it's something that impacts all of us. And that's something that I all care of about us, as a community member. I go to, you know, all of us who go to Cesar Chavez Park, there's not bathrooms. Right. There's not water fountains. This is all over the city. In order to, you know, 
clamp down on homelessness, nobody gets bathrooms, mm -hmm. nobody gets water mm -hmm. fountains, and you don't have garbages. Mm -hmm. um, because all of these things are taken away so that we can... Because there's a false assumption because there's that not it's public enabling space. people yeah. to provide water or bathrooms. And, or and garbages. Or garbages. And, because and we, we can hate them for leaving trash if... Yeah, right? Exactly. Right? It, but there's no garbages. I mean, like... <sighs> and we even rented a portable uh, porta potty and the city council asked us yeah. to move that. They so took that. we're doing everything that we can to comply yeah. with the city and to work with uh, with them, and uh, we I'm not going to say that there's been only negative response. Um, we are seeing some positive things happen, mm -hmm. but we're having a fight for it every day, and yeah. we're pushing. You've been out at yeah. Occupy; mm -hmm. um, it's going on close to 50 days, and we are going to keep occupying. Mm -hmm. And the thing I want to remind people is that this grew out of the Community Dinner Project, mm -hmm. which started December 8, 2014. Absolutely. It involved, you know, serving um, a nutritious dinner to those in poverty in violation of laws against doing that, ordinances. Shout out to Fago. <laughs> and do it. doing that at City Hall, where it matters, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Every week, every week for the entire year of 2014, then going in and speaking to City Hall. That is the presence that these people who are so marginalized have maintained mm -hmm. for a year. Mm -hmm. And then this year, it was obvious that an escalation was needed because there was no movement mm -hmm. at City Hall after a year of sustained effort. Mm -hmm. So the escalation has been very successful. A lot of things have been going on. Um, right. And it's not just because of that escalation. Let's recognize that there are a lot of organizations that have done a lot of work. The crim this, this bill, mm -hmm. the Homeless Bill of Rights, was in the previous legislature. Mm -hmm. I don't know how long it's been around. Mm -hmm. And I know that this bill is also one that they're carrying forward in Colorado yeah. and... Oregon. Oregon, yeah. that's right. Mm -hmm. So this is the Western Regency, Re Regional Advocacy Project. Mm -hmm. And they, they have that lovely motto, house keys, not handcuffs. Yep. So um, they're doing great work. Yep. And so this bill that, we're going to circle back to that bill again, because this is the new thing that's happened in the last two weeks, yes. is the reintroduction of this bill. Do you know very much? I mean, we're just, yeah. we've just written the bill. So yeah, the bill has just come out in the last couple of weeks. It does three primary things. So any city or county that accepts any type of state funding would no longer be allowed to enforce or enact any new um, anti-homelessness laws sort of to prevent uh, any type of rest. Like I said, sitting, sleeping, standing, laying down. Um, and it would also allow folks who are, um, whose rights have been violated in that way um, to receive compensation uh, through litigation in civil courts. So they would receive compensation up to $1,000 per incident of you know being ticketed, signed, cited, fined, or, or um, harassed for sitting or sleeping outside. Um, and then the third thing that it does is it would require communities across the state of California to send a copy of the sort of federal grant application that they send to HUD, is that the HUD to the state version, which is the Department of Housing and Community Development, because in it there are some questions that every community now has to answer about what they're doing to try to prevent the criminalization of homeless, homelessness at the local level. And there are two or three points allocated to the answer yeah. of that question. And it's interesting here in Sacramento because um, we had the strong mayor proposal that went down and then the mayor turned around and hired three new people to his office. Mm -hmm. And he said that these people were being hired for uh, the minimum wage in legis ordinance they worked on, which was a complete disaster. Like the homeless task force? And I hope not. <laughs> and, um, three. And, and, and they were also there to get more money you know, that they were going to pay for their salaries because they were going to be getting grants and stuff. And these grants, they're talking about HUD grants, and mm -hmm. they need to recognize those grants are now specifically yeah. penalizing mm -hmm. applicants for criminalization. Mm -hmm. And we can have Sacramento steps forward. Let's see, I was at City Council last week, and they were so happy. They were giving the guy an award because he got six new homes for homeless. Mm -hmm. Six. Mm -hmm. We have, on our last point and count, that was 2,500, and we know yeah. we don't count everyone. Yeah. I mean, that's like impossible. Six. Absolutely. Where's this money going, you know? It's a good question. It's a good question. Yeah. And, and, hmm, 
I kind of, where was I going with that? Mm. Well, I think that, you know, you really demonstrated a great point, which is that um, there is not nearly by far and away enough housing or services to meet the need in Sacramento. And so I think that um, some folks have been asking for a repeal of this anti-camping ordinance. Some folks have been saying, how about a moratorium until you realize a vision where nobody has to sleep outside if they don't want to. Um, and I think either one of those, you know, could be fine approaches that sort of recognize that, yeah, you know, decriminalizing homelessness isn't going to solve homelessness, but neither is criminalizing it, and actually that's going to exacerbate the problem. That's going to make it much worse because then you're saddling people with fines, with arresting, you know. Um, and, and things that can keep them from getting housing, keep them from getting mm -hmm. jobs, get, keep them from getting benefits. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of ramifications that I wish I would have spent more time talking about tonight yeah. in, in, in truth. Yeah. Yeah, there's 40 plus million dollars that are supposedly spent on homelessness and only 4,000 of those dollars have trickled over toward these homeless shelters. Mm -hmm. So we really do, we really are asking the question, where is this money going? It's a question a lot of we, really need, we really need to have mm -hmm. to, to really ask. Part of a We Are Tribe, Jose Ortiz over here, who's been arrested five times now just for sleeping. Um, I'm a performance enhancement specialist and a corrective exercise specialist at the National Academy of Sports Medicine. We use a goniometer for, that measures hip flexion. And uh, the last time I was uh, rudely uh, awoken by <laughs> a police officer, um, I brought that point up is how many degrees of hip flexion do I have to go into before I'm arrested or not arrested? Yeah. Um, because I could be laying there meditating for all the police officer knows. But as soon as the, the lights go down, as soon as the sun goes down, um, that's when the police come out and there is, there is definite harassment going on. Um, even during the day where people really are trying to catch up on their sleep, there is nowhere for them to sleep or nowhere for us to sleep because I'm in, in the same boat, always a deficit of sleep. Yeah, and I think because it's so hard to draw those lines, it's like that's where you see kind of the arbitrary and selective enforcement of those laws. You know, because you're like, yeah, okay, at what at what point am I even constituting Absolutely. sleep? Or, you know, can I rest my eyes? Or, you know, I think not realizing, too, that if somebody is resting, it's probably because they really need it, and we should probably let them, because that's yes. so crucial for a person's health well, and, and well-being. Well, actually, I do believe there that it's torture mm -hmm. to not let someone sleep. Yeah. That sleep is required Absolutely. for mental health and mm -hmm. physical health yeah. on a daily basis, actually. Waterboarding, sleep yeah. deprivation, those are all tools that have been used successfully in the past. And this is, and, and there doesn't seem to be a recognition <laughs> in this policy of that this is actually torture mm -hmm. um, in the policy here in right. Sacramento. But at the federal level, the Justice Department has said that this is unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. And I think they also said it was cruel and unusual mm -hmm. punishment also. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the right to rest, but it's to me also the right to nest, mm -hmm. to have a place that is mm -hmm. your own, a home base. In primitive societies, people would be pushed out of society they were denied society. They were not denied a place to live, a place to rest. Right. This, this you thing, things are worse now. And I think the point. point I was getting to, to earlier was that um, six people is what there was an award for. That there were six, obviously we're not providing, we're not gonna be able to provide 2,500, 3,000, you know, the, to, we're not gonna be able to meet the need. And so we have to have something because people are going to sleep tonight. They're mm -hmm. going to sleep tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. This isn't going to wait. Mm -hmm. And to me, we need a place, a safe ground. We need that camp site. And there's been movement on that. And, and that's something we absolutely have to have. And, and I feel that what's going on down there isn't like, uh, there's some confusion. The, the people who are protesting, they don't want to sleep everywhere. They don't mm -hmm. want to sleep in front of businesses. They don't mm -hmm. want to sleep. This isn't like I'm. Yeah. I know they want the the homeless ordinance overturned or yeah. or or stopped enforcement, mm -hmm. but it's not so they can sleep everywhere. Right. I mean, let's have a defined area. Mm -hmm. right. You know, we don't. It's, it's not either or. It's not. Right. And the, there's, there's 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 more than just yes no like yeah over here time and place restrictions yeah. are are something that would work well. 
Yeah. And the point is, you know, as we've already said in the point in time count in Sacramento, people are already sleeping on the streets. We already recognize that. There is a national homelessness count that recognizes people are sleeping on the streets. And so I think that it's very laudable for local electeds to say, well, you know, we don't believe that that's okay. And so that's why we're criminalizing homelessness um, as because we don't believe it's okay. Well, the fact of the matter is that it's happening, right? There are thousands of people sleeping on the streets in our community, let alone across the country, because this is a national Absolutely. crisis. Absolutely, a minimum of 2,700 around Sacramento and 100 died last year. So we yeah. really have to start taking care of this. And yeah. uh, that's why uh, we are a tribe, Sacramento. We really want to address that, um, what we call phase two is the, the city owns properties, um, warehouses, storefronts where we could be parlaying a lot of the donations that are coming in through Occupy mm -hmm. into real-time money, real solutions. Hey, it worked for Salvation Army, it worked for Goodwill, um, it worked for a, a handful of other multi-million dollar businesses so we're getting and it ready could work to, for them. We're getting mm -hmm. ready to get to the end of the show, so I kind of want to start closing down. If there's any last minute point you want to get out, this is the time to do it. I mean, I think, you know, what's the name of the bill again? Yeah, so the bill is SB 876. And um, it's, you can start advocating now. Yeah, you know, and I think that you can make up your own mind about what you want to do in terms of the bill. You can definitely get in touch with Senator Liu's office if you'd like to find out more information or if you'd like to, you know, specifically signal if support. Specifically if you're part of an organization that mm -hmm. you think can get your support because having the support of organizations is very important to electeds. Mm -hmm. Or you can tell your story about how you've been yes. personally impacted by this issue um, because that really goes a long way. Absolutely. Thank you. I really want to thank you all. We're getting ready to head out. It's been a great show. Um, it was wonderful to have you. Thanks for having thank us you. on. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm so happy to do another show on this. I know there's so much more to say, huh? It's like great to be here. <laughs> 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 but yeah. Do another 30 minutes. You, you were great. You were great. Oh, thank you.